You know, sometimes we take these beliefs like I'm bad and I'm not lovable. It just means you were with somebody maybe that wasn't the right fit for you. But it all starts with assessing where you are, what you need to work on, and step-by-step step working on those things. I just figured there was some internal flaw within me, so terrible, I believed externals would maybe make up. As I always say, if you don't show up for what's up, it's gonna keep showing up. I can take what I've gone through and actually use it as strength. Now, homies, let's freaking own that shit. Today, I specifically wanna talk about confidence and how that affects us showing up in the rest of our lives. And I've got a quote of yours, actually. Okay. Perfect way to start. Confidence is everything. It affects the way we perceive ourselves, how we interact with others, and definitely shapes our sex life. Mm -hmm. So how on earth, if we're single, are we able to gain the confidence in ourselves in order to then put ourselves out there to then date and then be in a rel relationship and then get the confidence in the bedroom? Okay, well first let's just start with being single. I think that a lot of people think of single as this, this stopover that I'm just gonna stay single and when I'm single, I can't wait to be in a relationship. But I really would love to encourage people that when you're single, it is such an excellent time to really get to know yourself, get to know what you're into, you know, what kind of friends you like, work on yourself, work on your, your mental health. It's such a great time to go to therapy and think about what do I actually want in a partner what do I want my life to look like? You know, a lot of us just sort of desperately are swiping through apps and we're trying to meet somebody, but we're not doing the important work that will allow us to make the best decisions going forward. We're not gonna pick always the best partners if we're just you know, coming from desperation mm -hmm. or coming from a place of lack or coming from a place of a deep insecurity that this person is gonna complete me. I would just like to debunk that whole like, you complete me thing. When we're looking for someone and we think this person's gonna fill me up and complete me, it's essentially saying I'm a half a person and I'm looking for another half a person and we're gonna become whole. But I think that that is such a faulty way of thinking to think that we're some way broken and someone's gonna fill us. So I think the more we can work on just becoming whole ourselves, we're more likely to attract a whole person. So that's important, think about that. So the confidence, I think, you know, when I think about confidence, I think that so much of it comes from our own limiting beliefs, our negative self-talk about ourselves, which sometimes it's so, we don't even know that we're doing it. We believe it's just the universal um, belief that we are bad, we are wrong, we are stupid, we are unlovable. Let's say we got out of a really bad relationship and we have these limiting beliefs and negative self-talk that I am not lovable, this person broke up with me, maybe someone ghosted you. Maybe you had abuse. There was just a lot of things going on in your past relationships. I think it's really important to first heal and do the work and think about what, what was it in this relationship that didn't work for me? What did it leave me feeling about myself? And what are the lessons I can learn? Because mm -hmm. sometimes we're leaving an unhealthy relationship and we think, I can't bear to be alone with myself. I'm just gonna grab the next person that's interested in me. And then we continue to repeat these patterns of dating people who are unavailable and not right for us. Everyone can kind of relate to, you know, oh, I always date the bad boy, or I always date the bad girl, and why, why, why does this keep happening to me? Well, it's happening to you because you are making choices that are not coming from a place of, of a deeper knowing and, and, and doing that work. So when I say do the work, I'm a huge fan of therapy because that's really gonna help you kind of break down the the, the patterns and knowing yourself. I think it's okay to kind of think about, you know, what did I do wrong? Or what would I like to learn from these relationships? It's not that you are a bad person. You know, sometimes we take these beliefs like I'm bad and I'm not lovable. It just means you were with somebody maybe that wasn't the right fit for you. Maybe there was some, you know, choices you made along the way. There's just a lot of great information that we can learn. So I always recommend take some time, learn about yourself, before you go back out there and date. I'm so glad you said that. And there was one thing that I didn't want to interrupt okay. you, but so far, because this is the problem that I worry about is if you're with somebody who, let's say, cheats on you, betrays you, um, there is a 
a part, at least for me, there would be a part that would absolutely, my confidence would get knocked because I would think it was about me. I would, even if I can say, well, he doesn't know what he has, right? Like we can all kind of try and brush it off. But ultimately I think deep down, I would worry, is this a reflection of me? Is this a reflection, am I pretty enough? Is my body good enough? How do we start to actually then unwind? What would you actually recommend if somebody is in a situation where they don't feel good enough, then they don't want to look in the mirror? Right, because they just they don't have confidence in their own body. We could talk about body confidence yeah. for a minute, but first, I mean, I just want to go back to the toxic relationship. That is a pattern. It is important to go to therapy, understand the pattern. Sometimes it comes from our childhood. It comes from our parents. It comes from you know, it's something like sometimes we're attracted to partners that are you know mimic something that we saw in childhood. And it feels safe and comfortable, but it doesn't mean that those are the kind of people that you need to keep continue to choose going forward. Mm. So body confidence is a whole other thing. So here's the thing. There's a lot of talk about body love. You need to love yourself. You need to, I just like to get people to like body acceptance or body neutrality. It's okay if you're neutral about your body, but if you're walking around in a body that all day long you're thinking, I hate my body. Um, I don't like the way my thighs look. I don't like my breasts. It's going to be really hard to not only attract a partner that is going to also feel good about your body. If you're walking around hating on your body, but it's gonna be really hard to step into your own sexuality, to feel sexual, to feel like you are deserving of pleasure, to feel that you are somebody that, um, that, that even knows how to sink into your body and ask for what you want. So it starts with, I have a few you know, tips for, for people who are suffering around this because we all do. We all go through phases of our lifetimes of feeling not great about our bodies. So remembering that if, if this is you and this, this resonates, there's one thing and that is the exposure exercise is what we call it. It's sort of the mirror exercise. Mm. And this is a practice of taking off your clothes, being in your room alone, no one's around, no one has to be around and you're actually are looking at your body naked. You are, t you're saying that people don't wanna look in the mirror. I'm asking you to look in the mirror at your body and say, what is it that you like about your body? That you, that you, I mean, it could be, I love my feet. My feet allow me to walk, walk up these stairs. My feet allow me to move across the city. You know, my hands, my great ears. I love these earrings. We can all find things on our bodies that we like. Mm. So that is one of the first practices. And some people are like, oh God, I couldn't do that. You don't have to strip down naked the first time. You could even just start by looking into our, into your, your own eyes, mm. looking into your face. We often don't do that. We just we don't make eye contact with others and we don't make eye contact with ourselves. And so I encourage that. I love that you actually even broke that down even further because I, that was gonna be my follow up question because sometimes people are just like, I don't even have the confidence to undress, let alone undress and then look at myself in the mirror. So having that kind of stepping stone is great. Yeah. Um, and then just even thinking beyond that, like what you were insinuating, which is, you know, if you're not, in fact, I actually have a quote, this hit the nail Very on the nice. head. Hands down, men and women say confidence is the sexiest trait in and out of the bedroom. Amazing. So now, if we want to be attractive to other people, not attracted, but attractive to other people, making sure that you feel good about your body when you're walking into the bedroom is so important. Because I even remember when I first started having sex with Tom, I was like, lights off, please. Like, as, as low lights yeah. as possible. And then realizing, wow, Confidence in and of itself is such an attractive trait to somebody that even if you don't feel confident, if you can learn to appear confident so that you start to feel it, it then still has the same knock-on effect. It does have the same effect. It can have the same effect if you think this is what confidence looks like, you know, kind of like the fake it till you make it thing. But I do think that that can absolutely work. But if you think about it, if you are walking around and you are not feeling good in your body and you're hating on your body, because well, I hear from so many women who think I'm never in the mood for sex and, or my partner doesn't know what I want in the bedroom. It's like, but if you are constantly like bashing yourself and you have this negative tape going all the time, it's not like you're gonna be able to spring into action when you're supposed to be you know, having sex and being in a sexual moment. Mm -hmm. So I think that, and that's another thing, if you have the, like, the lights out, right? That whole lights out in the bedroom is such a, that's so common all the time. With women though, right? Women. But some men too. I hear from men. I hear from all really? people that we want the lights out. And to me, that's a sign. So if you're thinking, I'm not sure how confident I am. If you only want the lights out and you're doing the sidestep backwards for the people. I always hear from my friends. I remember saying that they, they'd have sex with somebody. And they're like, then they get out of bed and they walk backwards into the ba bathroom after <laughs> sex because they don't want anyone looking at their bum. 
I know. So that's why this movement to exercise or looking in the mirror or mm. moving your body, doing dance, doing um, anything to make you feel more connected to your pelvic floor, especially as women, we have like these S curves in our body. There's like the pole dancing classes, mm -hmm. which I used to think those were kind of silly because why would I want to do a strip tease for my partner? How is that helping me? But that it's actually all about women getting confident in their own bodies. So finding a dance class near you, something that's like sensual dance and just moving your body, even if it's exercise or swimming or running, like being comfortable, it being embodied and in your body. So that is just a really important, like moving it and feeling safe. And then also with these partners feeling comfortable, like the confidence comes also from, from our bodies comes from communication and talking to our partners about what we actually need and what feels good to us. Well, there's actually one thing that you just said that I didn't want to interrupt you, but it was amazing. Um, I felt that when I started to date Dom, Tom and I started to sleep with him, all my insecurities, right? And like you said, everyone has parts of their body that's insecure. I actually thought I've got the best strategy. I'm going to tell him that I know that they exist. That way he just knows and I don't have to worry about it. Of course, that was the terrible strategy now in hindsight. But I really thought that if I tell him, babe, I know I've got a rib popping out. Yeah, I know this ugly rib. Like I actually thought if I made him aware that I knew it was ugly, that he then would be okay with it. But what I was doing is just showing him more and more my insecurity. And at the time I thought it was a great strategy because I thought <laughs> it relieves me from the worry that, oh my God, is he gonna notice that I have a sticking out rib? Well, because the concern. And so I thought, get confident, Lisa. The confidence means just say it. Well, of course, now looking back, that wasn't the right strategy. The right strategy would have been, you need to get confident in that rib before you even sleep with someone or before you even think about it. Get confident within yourself. And then why do I have to mention it? If he thinks that this is something bad on me, then that's on him and then he's not the right partner. But that comes with freaking confidence, right? That comes with having to over time build that up. And I remember thinking in the flip side, would I want him to keep coming to me, saying to me all the time, babe, I know that this isn't good. And babe, I don't, I know this part of me isn't great. And I know that this bit's getting a bit flabby. And I know that, oh, no, that wouldn't be attractive. Like I, I would actually rather him fake, like hell yeah. Like I would be attracted to him. And I think then the, the sexual tension would then give him the confidence. Um, but by pointing it out, it's not an attractive no, thing. No, it's not as attractive. It's really not. I mean, we, we always say confidence is the most sexiest thing in the bedroom or in a relationship, and it really is. And so I think that that's such an important point you're making, though, because we all have things about ourselves that we don't, that aren't our favorite parts. But why don't we lead with what we do like? Why don't we lead with parts of our body that, you know, you don't, ha and also I want to say, you don't have to get completely naked in the bedroom. I always encourage this with women, especially if there's like a, you know, something that you feel sexy in. I mean, there's all this lingerie, maybe that works for you, maybe it doesn't, but maybe you love, you know, shirts with ties in them. You love a tie around your neck or you love an off the shoulder blouse or you love wearing like little skirts or shorts. You can leave your clothes out. If that's gonna allow you to move and be truly embodied with a partner, like do you. Mm. That is the most confident thing in the world when you show up as someone who knows what she wants. So when we're talking about that, it's like you, a lot of women too are also focused on the the the, the external part of sex, which is how they look, mm. and we're in our heads the whole time. But when we're in our heads worrying about sex the whole time, we first of all the blood is washing away from our genitals and it's going to our head, oh, and so we're no longer we're not me. turned on, we're not aroused. That's so true. Yeah, but when we are really, and I, I'm going to say it again, embodied, which means like you are in your body. Mm -hmm and you understand your own pleasure and what feels good. Now this takes from work on your own, whether it's masturbation, it's, it's communication with your partner outside the bedroom about what feels good. When you are truly having more pleasure, more orgasms, more arousal, and you deeply understand your arousal and your turn-ons, it sort of trumps everything else. You will no longer be focused on your little ribs, your thighs, or whatever it is that's bothering you. You will be connected, you will be, you know, aroused and turned on and, and, and ready to have sex. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. 
And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confident workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. And I love that, but the funny thing is, it feels like a chicken and the egg, right? Like, which one comes first? It's like, well, the more you're having great sex, the more you're orgasming, the more you're masturbating, the better and more confident you will feel. But if you don't have the confidence to allow yourself to orgasm, to masturbate, then it doesn't have the knock-on effect. That's exactly, that's exactly it. And so that's what we have to, and also I want people to know that confidence is not a destination. <laughs> yeah. Confidence is a journey. And it is a lifetime journey. It is something that some days you're feeling really confident, some days you're not. And I wish that I would just love to normalize that process. And what really helps me and others that I, you know, I advise is like keeping affirmations that are, if you have a negative self tape, that's I'm fat, I'm not lovable, no one's gonna like me, I hate my thighs, I have weird vulva, you know, my labias are strange. You have got to, it is, it is imperative that you have the flip side of that thought. I like my body. My body gets me from point A to A to B. I am somebody who's who's available and responsible for my own pleasure. I deserve, mm -hmm. you know, I deserve to feel good. And um, all the things, all the ways that you, you just have to find your, your flip side of that, your affirmations, your, you know, and it helps to have them in your phone or to write them mm -hmm. out. It is a very powerful practice and it is a, and it is a process and it is practice, but it again, it is not a place that you arrive and you are always confident because also our body is always changing. Mm -hmm. Our body changes from year to year, decade to decade, sometimes month to month. And if we are reliant on feeling 100% confident every time we have sex, most of us would just be celibate for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that comes from, from finding partners that we trust and that we feel, you know, we, they make us feel like the best version of ourselves. Especially if you've been with people who don't make you feel that way, you might have a hard time believing that those people actually exist, but I promise you they do. Once you've identified that negative pattern you have of dating people who aren't available, who make you feel bad, you, you, it will no longer be interesting to you to date those people, but you'll start to feel like how good it feels to be with a person who just, who accepts all of you. Mm, I love that. There's two things there that's so freaking powerful. First of all, you saying that um, confidence isn't the final destination. Girl, I'm so freaking with you. I think that we've got so caught up in this is what I need. But the way that I actually like to say it is it's the tool you use to get to what you actually want. So people think what I actually want is confidence, but that's not true. What you actually want is confidence to to do what with, to feel good in the bedroom, to be, to be sexually open. Okay, then that's your goal. The goal isn't the confidence in and of itself. So now instead of getting ourselves all tied up in how do I get to the actual confidence, I'd like to kind of shed all that and say, okay, how do I now feel good with my partner naked? It's a totally different framing, right? Because now it's not a, do I have confidence, yes or no? It's a, okay, I know what I'm trying to get to. Now, Emily's just are very beautifully articulated that I can look in myself in the mirror first. I don't have to get undressed and then I can take my shirt off, right? Then it becomes very tactical. Then it becomes, don't get in your own head about if you have the confidence or not. Just take the steps and then go, now I am working towards, and you even said it's the journey, I'm now working towards getting comfortable with my partner. I freaking love that. So the second thing I actually remember you saying is about how your body changes. Yes. I think that is so important. And the reason why I think it's so important is because for me, I plan to be with my husband for the rest of my life. Yeah. My body is going to change. I was 21 when I met him. That's So do I think I'm going to be have the same tight ass <laughs> <laughs> when I first met him to when I'm married and in my 80s? Of course not. So now I actually do the internal work in my 40s. I'm in early 40s. I do the work now. Now. So that when I'm 80, I don't feel bad about myself because I know it's coming. And instead of it like blindsiding me when I get to 80, that all of a sudden my boobs are hitting my feet, you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I've already done the internal work so that I can't wait to get there. Right. And the biggest thing that I do with that, and I'm still on my journey, but the thing that I do was um, a friend called Lillian Garcia told me that she went on stage she did this big announcement. She was like hosting WWE and it was her birthday and she lied about how old she was. And somebody pulled her aside and said, you either have a choice, get old or die. And if you're getting older, 
isn't that better than dying? So why not celebrate it? And that changed everything for me. I was like, yes, now if I get the sunspots, if I get the wrinkles, right? Like if I get all the things where I'm like, oh, my, my thighs aren't as, you know, how they used to be in my 20s. I just say, but Lisa, would you rather that or would you rather be buried in the ground? Exactly. And it just makes it, me allowed to settle into my body changing, my body growing and the beauty that comes with the age. There's so much beauty and wisdom that comes with aging. And I think it's really hard with women too because we sort of glorify like the dad bod mm -hmm. or the silver fox. But for women, we're getting mm. older and it's like, you know, it's just, it's not as glorified. Like I can't, I wish women were like, oh, how great that she's getting round in the middle and the hormones. We don't talk about any of that. And it's so, it's, it's really more of a struggle. And so it's more about how you show up for yourself is mm -hmm. how you're gonna show up for everyone else. And if you feel that this is kind of just a lot, I mean, maybe hearing like exposure exercise and just, you know, fake it till you make it, I, I understand that. And also in thinking about the conditions, do you realize that you are deserving of sexual pleasure? That you would love to have an intimate relationship? That you deserve to feel good in your body? That exploring your sexual health is a lifelong journey and it's crucial for your overall health and wellness. So if everything you just said, do you want to live a life of pleasure? Do you want to be connecting with your partner until the, your dying day? Do you want to feel good about yourself? Do you want to be sexually satisfied? If your answer is yes, now at least they know what the goal is and what they're trying to get to. And now when you suggest, guys, I know it's going to be hard, but look in the mirror and take your shirt off. That moment where people may be resistant, they can come back to the fact that they answered the question, that they do want it. Exactly, Lisa. I hope that everyone listening wants it. I hope that you feel that pleasure is your birthright and you all deserve to have pleasure. And if the thing that's keeping you from that, for so many of us, it's our own limiting beliefs. It's the negative mm. self-talk. And I, I deal with that still all the time. I mean, I, I have it in, you know, in my body or in other places and I just have to stop. I mean, it really is a practice of saying, okay, you know, I am... I have all these things going, all these things in my life. I have great friends, I have a lot of love, and my body's amazing, and it can do all of these things. And, and I am my own worst critic. We are our own worst enemies. If we can also remember that, it's just really important to take a step back that your thoughts are not the truth. And your thoughts are actually something that is keeping you from living the life that you want and finding the partners you want. And confidence in the bedroom or confidence in the boardroom really just starts with you and realizing that you, you know, again, that you deserve it and then you deserve to take the time to feel good and what, you know, and surrounding yourself with people that make you feel good. And the other thing I want to say about this too is if you are doing things, if you're following people on social media that make you feel bad, unfollow those people. Find people who are more like you. Find bodies that represent your body type. You know, surround mm -hmm. yourself with sex positive messages and body positive messages. It's, it's, it's unrealistic standards that we see. Everyone's airbrushed. There's so many great accounts that sort of show you that now in social media they're like this is what happened this is how i really look this is how i'm standing i mean we have to remember that that we are holding ourselves up to the unreal unrealistic expectations we have of ourselves but also in society that isn't even real and so like where is it coming from like it's it could be that for some people they had a partner maybe once they had a partner who shamed them who said oh you know i don't love your breasts or i don't this this thing's out of place your left breast bigger than your right and we carry that on for a lifetime. Like I have people who call into my show and they're like, 20 years ago, a woman said something about my penis and now I can't, you know, I don't even know how I'm ever gonna find someone. Wow. And just again, that, that was somebody else's belief. It's not the truth. And what do you want to believe? Because if you're thinking that we get to program our own thoughts, like we are in charge, Let's program it with the good ones. Let's program with the thoughts and the beliefs that serve us, you know? And, and, and I think just recognizing that that's what it is, is your very first step that, oh, maybe it's not true. Maybe I am lovable. Maybe I can't have incredible sex at any, at any size, you know, with anything in my body. We are all capable of, you know, we all have a mind, our brain's the largest sexual organ, but if it's filled with, you know, crap that's preventing <laughs> us from having sex, it's not gonna work. So once we can release those messages, and go towards our sensuality and desire, we be better off. And where I want to start is, don't call me crazy. 
Mm -hmm. And the reason why I want to start there is the amount of us women who have been in situations where we have an emotional reaction, whether it's from being triggered or we feel some sort of shame or embarrassment. And as a result, we get called crazy for it. And that can actually be a massive hindrance to our growth and our evolution and then improving ourselves. So I really want to start um, there and talk about triggers and how we perceive them um, from the outside and then how we actually work on them on the inside. Yeah. You're referencing one of the chapters in Happy Days, my new book. And yeah, that chapter is called Don't Call Me Crazy. And it's actually a really profound part of the book where I really introduce my experience with depression and anxiety and what activates that. But to start, I think I'm going to begin with what you just asked, which is really identifying our triggers. We all have these moments in time when we get super activated, but we don't know why often. And we get triggered and we notice, oh, oh, I'm freaking out and we have a feeling and then we run from that feeling. And the ways that we run from those feelings is workaholism or overeating or any form of addiction, rage, uh, negative self-talk. We do a lot of things over the trigger response, the feeling of the trigger. And that actually becomes the trigger response, how we react over that feeling. And in the beginning of this book, I just dive right in with noticing your triggers, noticing how they're affecting your life, and giving yourself the opportunity to take an inventory of all of the patterns in your conscious or subconscious that are showing up over and over again. Because I always say, if you don't show up for what's up, it's going to keep showing up. And that's, that's a huge message that's going to come through this instantly as you start this practice. So it's as simple as noticing what triggers you, noticing how it feels, and then noticing what you do in response to that feeling. Yeah, God, I love that girl so much. And um, it was very fascinating because I always like to be challenged and um, improve. And so when I think of triggers before, it was always like, okay, why am I having this trigger? And that's where to start. But I actually love that you say in the book that isn't the way where to start. And it really is just to observe. So actually, like you just laid out the beautiful steps. Can you take me a little deeper? So when you're observing, it's very hard in that moment to pull yourself out and have the non-biased view of what is going on. How do you um, how do you start to take that observation without the judgment? Yeah. Well, all throughout the book, I reference um, a beautiful therapeutic practice that I've been trained in and called internal family systems, otherwise known as IFS. And I have a whole chapter on it, and then I have practices in the book that relate to it. And I really love the qualities. I want to really tap into what the qualities that we all have within ourselves Because when we start to attune to and recognize and respect and honor these qualities, that's when we begin to change how we react to our patterns, our triggers, and all the negative behavior that we put out. And so in the book, the self energy is what I reference. And it's it's known in IFS as as self. And in other spiritual programs or belief systems, it could be higher self or inner guidance system. And in this therapeutic practice, it's known as self with a capital S. And it's a quality that we all have. It is an energetic presence that we all have within us. That presence is curious and it's compassionate and it's courageous and it's calm and creative. And when we start to develop a connection to that part of who we are, that truth of who we are, that's when we can start to relate to our triggers with more compassion and courage and curiosity and calmness. And so the first question would be really looking at the trigger, noticing, oh, there I am again in that workaholism or whatever it is, and ask, just get curious. Ask it what it needs to reveal to you. Ask it if it needs a hug. You know, just start to get mm-hmm. curious and let, it, let that voice of, of the trigger speak back to you. It, sound, it might sound strange at first, but it's profound what will be revealed when you start to become curious about what those parts of yourself actually need. That's amazing. What if the voice coming back to you is mean and cruel? So the voices that we will internally hear are known as protector parts. And really what's happening is we have these 
parts of ourselves from childhood that are that are trauma with a big T, trauma with a small T. Big T trauma could be sexual violence or neglect or alcoholic parent. Small T trauma could be bullied or told you were stupid. And so we push down and exile those child parts of ourselves and build up all these protectors, protection mechanisms, you might call them coping mechanisms, to really anesthetize and numb out that suffering and never talk of it again. So the protectors are the workaholic, the addict, the controller, the people pleaser, all the ways that we deflect and push down that deeper impermissible feeling. And instead of noticing their back talk, like let's say a protector is being nasty to you to answer your question and speaking back to you and challenging you, the, the work here is just to continue to meet it with more compassion, with mm -hmm. more curiosity, and to really witness that these are all valuable parts of who we are, all these different reactivities and everything that's there is valuable as long as it's not in its extreme role. So, so much of this book is about self-regulation and mm -hmm. witnessing and really honoring everything internally, physically, in a somatic experience, as well as the inner dialogue protector parts that we have built up against the feelings of, in, of not being safe. Yeah, there were some super freaking powerful moments. If you don't mind, we dig a little deeper into certain stories that you told that I was like, I really felt it. And so you, your entire history and everything you've done and just the amazing content you've created and the books and everything that you've ever done is very much guided with spirituality. And you haven't very often, you haven't spoken about medication. And then you find yourself in a situation where now you have to go on medication. And that mm. really hit me for multiple reasons because I think we hold our identity to how other people see us. We yeah. hold our identity to what we've done in the past. And that actually, in this situation, um, it was a great almost example to show how our identity can actually hold us back from progressing. And so can you actually take us through that and how you came yeah. to that conclusion? Back to the chapter, don't call me crazy. All right, so I- uh, I told you I love the chapter, girl. <laughs> uh, so I, I opened that chapter with a story of being in the back seat of my car with my four-month-old son and my husband driving, and we're driving to my in-law's house for Mother's Day. And I'm sitting in the back seat, and I say to myself, I wanna die. And I get to my in-law's house, and I'm sitting at the dinner table and my sister-in-law is sitting with me and I just start crying. And I just say, I can't go on like this. And my mother-in-law comes over and she puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, oh honey, everybody has new mom anxiety. And I looked at her and I was like, this is more than just new mom anxiety. And I carried on like that for four months in this suicidal ideation in extreme anxiety, extreme depression, and insomnia, literally not sleeping a night. And that was making me mad, mad, like mad in my mind, and very angry, exactly. But I was just trying everything that I knew. I was trying all the holistic remedies and the ashwagandha and the melatonin and anything that seemed like it was acceptable in this wellness space that I was in. And never would I contemplate accepting a diagnosis and let alone accepting any kind of medicated path. But then I hit a bottom and it was ironic that the bottom I hit had to do with my work, right? Like finally <laughs> something made me stop and, and ask deeper questions. But I, I, I had a, a talk in New York City and I went to my apartment and I didn't sleep the night before and I called the, produ the event producers the next day, and this is my first time in 16, in 20 years of being a speaker, that I canceled a talk. And I said, I just can't make it, I didn't sleep last night. That was, a, a, that was my bottom. For whatever reason, that was the moment where I was like, I can't move forward. I called my therapist, as I'd, I'd been doing every single morning, pretty much calling her and telling her about my lack of sleep the night before. And finally, she said, get Zach on the phone. That, that's my husband. Get Zach on the phone. And she pretty much staged an intervention. She was like, you need psychiatric support right now. You're having a biochemical condition. And that, that was the moment when I turned, turned it over to God, what got my ass over to the psychiatrist. Within 10 minutes, she gave me a clear diagnosis. You have 
postpartum depression and anxiety. And she looked at me and she said, you've done a lot of personal growth work and a lot of trauma recovery and a lot of spiritual development. But now with the prescription I'm going to give you for this antidepressant, and it will help with your anxiety, I believe that you will be able to do far deeper work than you've ever been able to do before because you'll have a new baseline of safety. And that's what really gave me full body permission to just take advantage of this resource that God was giving me that came in the form of a prescription drug. And a prescription drug that I otherwise would have been so placing such a stigma upon and shameful of was ultimately what not only saved my life, but also gave me a greater sense of profound living than I'd ever known before because it gave me that baseline of safety to go far deeper in my therapeutic work. Because I was no longer in extreme terror and hypervigilance, I could settle in my nervous system and explore deeper parts of myself that really needed to be healed. And that's that's how a self-help book author and spiritual teacher was guided by God. I believe that God is in all of it, in the psychiatrist, in the medication, mm. and in the ashwagandha, and in the meditation. But it's it's all. When we're being guided and we're resisting that guidance, we block the miracles. And I'm just grateful that I hit enough of a bottom to really learn that there was another way out. And that way out was going to be through deep therapy, but also the support of a medication that would settle my system enough to do that deeper work. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And do you think then part of that evolution was um, the perspective that you had on who you were and what you were doing? So instead of being, I won't take drugs, I am holistic, it's the reframing of I'm the person that wants to improve myself. Definitely, 100%. I think that Throughout my life, I've been in a really devotional pursuit of freedom, inner freedom. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't always been easy for me to get to the next up-leveling or the next up-leveling because I'm stubborn and I, I've been at times very fixed in my ways. But mm -hmm. there's been many moments that have been a cracking open that have allowed me to step up to the next level of where I need to be spiritually and emotionally and in my internal state getting sober at 25 and putting down the drugs was one one big leap into that next phase. Uh, remembering trauma at 36 and really experiencing the full body memory of a dissociated trauma from my childhood put me into this up leveling of, okay, we got to go bigger. And the only way I was able to up level in these, cri in these moments of crisis was because I was so devoted to feeling free, to being free in my energy system. And the same thing happened when I had the postpartum experience and went to that next level. Wow, that's so powerful because I think that I was going to follow up the question. You already answered it. It's like, what is the difference between people that end up stuck in this vicious cycle, in this vicious loop that they can't get out compared to someone like you who... You said you're stubborn, it is very difficult, but you're still able to level up. So you even called it like the crack point or something like that. It was like, I was gonna say, how do you get to that point and push yourself? Mm -hmm. Because being on that cycle can also can feel very crippling. And then you feel like there's no way out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, uh, Amma the Hugging Saint has this beautiful quote. When an eggshell is cracked from the outside, it's broken. But when it's cracked from the inside, it's reborn. So I believe that being willing to crack and brave enough to wonder what lives underneath the surface of that eggshell is what allows us to really go to the next level in our personal development and in our, in our pursuit of freedom and happiness and peace. And so everyone has that available to them. Some people, particularly those suffering with biochemical conditions, it's, 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 it's much harder because they, they are literally in a neural loop that without some support they can't necessarily get out of. But mm -hmm. they have hope too because their ability to 
seek psychiatric support can be that step for them. And all of us get into these neural loops of repeated stories from our history that we get so hooked into that build up a belief about the life that we have, build up all these different forms of protection to push down those numb feelings that we don't want to feel ever again. And we just get into that cycle. And that cycle is starting to break for many more people now more than ever because we've all lived through this collective crisis. There's so much more Mm. uh, emphasis on mental health. There's almost like a greater freedom in being in dialogue about how you're feeling than ever before. In my circles, in our circles, where we have all these sort of emo friends and we're like really into personal growth, we could, you and I could call each other up and I'd be like, how are you? And I'd be like, I'm really fucked up right now, you know, and just tell the truth. But that's not normal for most people. Most people just don't say how they feel. But with this global pandemic that we've just lived, that we're living through, we're witnessing so many more people just acknowledging that they're suffering. And that's the door opener. The moment that you acknowledge your suffering, you open an invisible door to receive guidance. And hopefully, whoever needs that guidance can open that door and be guided to a book like mine or any other book that's serving them or a therapist or a friend or a podcast, whatever it might be. There's never been a better time than now for people to experience this type of awakening because we need it now more than ever. We need to feel safe in our body We need to release the stories from our past. We need to know how to self-regulate our energy and our anxiety and our depression. We need to know when to seek greater counsel and support. And we need tools. Oh, and that's why I freaking love it so much is that it's giving the tools and the tips. And as I mentioned earlier, it's depending on where you are, this is my advice. And so it really does cover multiple different um, levels to meeting someone where they really are versus saying, okay, this is where you are. And I really love that. And it's so beautiful. Um, The one thing that as you were talking, I think about, you know, from the outside things like drugs, alcohol, you know, seem as like an obvious vice that people go to and you kind of know instinctually that you know it if you're doing it more and more that maybe it's become a problem but you also talk about one thing that um, we as humans do that you've done many times is seek other relationships as the crutch and I actually have a quote of yours about being alone and then the, the fear of us being alone is sometimes too difficult um, and I, you, I pulled a quote, it says, I thought that a partner could fix my pain and make me whole. I turned my boyfriends into God. The fear of not having a boyfriend was so de- debilitating that I spent years in relationships with people who weren't right for me simply to avoid being alone. Mm. Yeah. Talk to me a bit about that because I think it's so sadly common. And I mm. think that that's one of those things I don't think necessarily we as humans sometimes realize we're doing like we do with drugs and alcohol. I don't yeah. think we realize that as much with the heart. Yeah. Codependency and uh, ang- anxious attachment style is often un- overlooked because it's not life threatening. Mm. Oh, not always. At times, I'm sure it can be. But it's not it's not as obviously life threatening as drug addiction and alcoholism but it's absolutely unmanageable and you become powerless over your drug of choice which in this case is a relationship so that is the definition of addiction when it's unmanageable and you're powerless this is the 12-step definition and so we we notice often when we get clean and sober off of drugs and alcohol we pick up a lot of other addictions and in my case I picked up work addiction and codependency And the codependency for me was something that was quite debilitating. And I understand now that my attachment style was an anxious attachment style, which means that growing up, I felt very anxious with my parents and I didn't know what I was going to get each day. Am I going to get a connection? Am I going to get no connection? So that creates a real anxious attachment style. And that individual as an adult will typically fawn and cling and try to really establish connection at all costs. And you know who you are, you know, you're the one that's like zero to 10 in the relationship, you know, you show up with your luggage at the first date, and you're like, I'm moving in. And in that place, we really, we really deny ourselves the ability to to truly enjoy 
the connection of real real relationships because mm-hmm. we're just looking for any form of sin- security and safety. And so I go I go into that as well. I mean, I go into all of it in the book. As you know, it's so crazy. I just, anyone that's read this book is like, I can't believe you packed it all in. <laughs> but I, I needed to because I needed the reader to be able to see this is why you've been running. And this is and help them recognize what they've been running from and how they've been running from it. Mm-hmm. And then give them the steps and the model for how to undo those patterns. Yes, you actually talk about running and how that um, we're we're trying to escape and it actually just prolongs the cycle of staying in that. Um, How do we identify that we're actually running? Because sometimes it feels like I'm playing it safe. Like this is the better thing to do to move away from what is making me anxious or overwhelmed. So what, how do you define the difference between running or getting yourself space and how do you process it so that you know um, that your actions are actually serving what you're trying to do? We are running from impermissible feelings and energetic disturbances from our childhood. And they often can be reactivated in moments of crisis and and feeling out of control or something goes wrong. So we can get, or big life changes. So we can get, we can reactivate those feelings of those traumas and those impermissible feelings of those childhood wounds can be reactivated during COVID. They can be reactivated when you feel out of control. They can be mm-hmm. reactivated when you feel like someone isn't doesn't like you. They can be reactivated by looking at social media and comparing yourself to people. And when they get reactivated, instead of facing the deeper wound of the feeling of being unlovable or inadequate, whatever may have happened as a child, we just build up these protection mechanisms to avoid ever having to face those child parts. And so the protectors are the ways that we run. We run with the mm-hmm. addictive behaviors. We run with the work. We run with the people pleasing. We run with the even just a physical symptom could be another way we run because often there's a psychosomatic effect of these impermissible feelings. If you don't feel the deep stuff, it could show up as a migraine. It could show up as gut issues. It could show up as uh, insomnia. And you and I have talked about this a lot. And so, and I'm very open in the book about all the gastrointestinal issues I had because of the impermissible feelings I was so afraid to reach into. And the miracle is that now on the other side of this, having undergone the deep healing that I needed to get to place of safety in my, in my own internal system, I have zero gastrointestinal issues. And I sleep through the night with no... CBD, no medication, no melatonin. I sleep 12 hours, 10 hours, not 12 hours, 10 hours a night. I wish I slept 12 hours sometimes. <laughs> and yeah. 10 is like 12 when you're 42. And um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's just, it's just profound what can happen when you do this kind of healing work. How do you deal with an insecure person making you feel guilty for your newfound confidence? Like friends who are used to being less confident, kind of giving you flack for actually starting to feel good. Oh, okay, this is a tricky one. You go from this is who I am to now I'm working on myself and I want growth. It's very tricky, that first like step into the new life that you want to live. And the reason why it's tricky is you have an entire history of... Um, of a relationship with other people. You literally have, you know, you just mentioned your friends. I don't know how long you've been with your friends, but let's talk, assume it's friends and family. So people have known you for years and years and years and years and years. And us as humans, we kind of, it it makes us comfortable to think of a certain person as this way. You are this way, you are this way. Think of how many people, in fact, we all do it. Guys, how many of us have actually done it? Well, we've seen someone like Jay, Jay Lo, who's an amazing freaking dancer and an amazing singer, then start movies. I personally didn't say, because I love my J-Lo, but how many people are like, who the hell does she think she is, this singer trying out the acting thing? Well, no, hang on a minute. For we knew, she's been acting for 20 years. She's never, never done it in front of the camera. But my point being is, it feels comfortable for us to put us, each other and everybody else into these buckets. So just understand that that's where you're starting from, that you are currently in a bucket. Now, how other people see you in this bucket, but you are in a bucket. And now what you're doing is you're taking yourself out of it and you're saying, I want more. It can be difficult for other people to understand and actually adapt to the fact that, oh my God, well, well who are you now? Well, well, what bucket do I put you in? So it's going to sometimes cause anxiety for other people. Knowing that just now allows you to address the actual issue um, with your eyes wide open 
right? So, okay, you know now I want growth. I want to do better. I'm so confident. I'm really like, I'm really working on myself and I'm so freaking proud that I'm confident. And all of a sudden I'm now this person that can set boundaries. Well, you can imagine everyone around you who you never had any boundaries with, all of a sudden you're saying to them, oh, actually now I'm putting parameters around you. They just don't perceive it as being feeling good. So everybody, everybody sees it from their own perspective. So when you're coming, you're seeing it from yours. You're saying, I'm finding this newfound confidence and other people are getting in the way, right? Perfect example. So we all see it from our own, our own stance. So now put yourself in your friend's shoes if, or your family's shoes. If you're the one that is seeking the confidence, if you're the one that is seeking the growth and they aren't, whether we like it or not, sometimes, especially if people have insecurities, like really deep insecurities, they won't be able to see past how that is a reflection of them, how your growth, how, uh, how your um, development is a reflection of them not growing, not developing. In fact, perfect example, because I'm such a visual person, perfect example is when you go to the gym, right? Let's say you are um, overweight and you have an overweight friend and you're like, this is the year I want to get healthy. I want to love my life. I want to feel the energy. I want to like, like you have a vision of what you want. I want to run a marathon, whatever it is. And so one person starts going on that journey. Well, now what happens is your reflection of you losing weight, the reflection of you getting healthy, being able to run, where maybe both of you bonded over getting on the elevator together. Well, now one of you is like, I'm not getting on the elevator. I'm taking the stairs. Like I, I need, I want to, you know, get the exercise in. So now you're changing the dynamic, you're changing the relationship, which isn't bad. I'm just giving you the facts. You're changing. And so in that change, you're now highlighting all the things that they felt as normal, as safe, as taking the elevator with their, with their friend, as you know, eating that cake, that fudge cake at the end of every meal when, um, when you do girls night. Now all of your behavior change is now a reflection of them and now they have to take a hard look at themselves. And it's tough, guys, it really is. And I say that with other compassion. It's just not easy. And so what I do now is I just go, okay, my confidence cannot have a reflection of how other people treat me. If other people try and keep me down, if other people try and tell me, oh my God, you've changed and I don't know who you are. I cannot let my growth and my confidence get impacted by other people. Boom, number one. But just like I exp expressed, Number two is just understanding the other person, the other person's perspective and how your change and your growth will make them feel and how it will reflect on them. I'm, again, I'm not saying that this is right. I'm just saying we're humans. We all have a perspective and we all have insecurities and we all have our own feelings. And so just at least understanding that helps you then hopefully approach certain situations with some, um, to be honest, kindness. That's really it. It's like, I don't want my confidence to make other people feel badly. Like I really don't. But the truth is, I still want to be confident and I still want to grow. So there are ways to deal with it. There's ways to talk to your friends. There's ways to, you know, um, talk to people about your growth without making them feel badly. But that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that you should not be freaking proud of it. It doesn't mean you should not talk about your com uh, how you found this new confidence. It doesn't mean that you should lessen or diminish your confidence because of how it impacts others. Just be sensitive to it. Okay, there's a huge difference. Do not diminish, diminish your confidence. Do not fake that you are not confident if you really are. But just be sensitive to the people you are talking to when your newfound swagger comes on or whatever you want to call it, um, just be sensitive to that it's going to impact people. And if there are people that really don't care and their own emotions are just too overwhelming and they can't see it and all they want to do is bring you down because, oh my God, like, yes, your confidence is just making them feel bad. And then you see the evil side of them and they come and they're just trying to tear you down. At that point, to be honest to me, I'd be like, I, just want, I don't want them in my life. Like I'm trying to approach them. Like, who do you want to be? I want to be a good friend. I'm going to approach them with some um, sweetness, kindness, sensitivity, empathy. But let me tell you, if they're gonna keep going, if they're gonna try and tear me down, if they're gonna try and make me feel less than, peace, I'm out of there. So, I've, because I've given them the grace, that's actually why. I have the confidence to leave that friendship because I came in with all the best intentions and actually trying to think of them. And if they cannot do the same, then hey, let's face it, friendship 
Friendships are 50 freaking 50, period. So you should never just be giving, 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 giving to somebody else who is so insecure that they cannot finally give back or hear you or appreciate you. So there's a lot of nuance there, guys, but it is very, very important that you make sure no matter what, no matter who is in your life, no matter how much you like them, no matter how much you love them, no matter how much you mean to them, that you do not allow them to negatively affect your newfound confidence. What daily routine or practice can you help me stay on top of feeling confident? All right, guys, this is such a great question because that's the thing, you feel confident. It isn't a, a binary, you either have it or you don't. So it's gonna be like anything. It's gonna be like happiness. It's gonna be like sadness. It freaking ebbs and flows. So the question is amazing because it really is, what do I do to my daily routine so that I can maintain this? So I can stay on top of it. That's so beautiful. But here's gonna be a couple of things that I'm gonna throw out that you guys can easily do that I do personally. Let's take this shoot. Right. You guys probably think, oh, well, Lisa, she, she shows up and she just does her thing. Oh, oh, no, I don't. Oh my God. I have to like gear up. I actually have to get my mind. And in fact, Eric, come here. I'm sorry, guys. This is going to be weird. I'm going to bring Eric on set. Come on, Eric. I'm going to tell. What did I just literally tell you? Look at the camera and I want you to tell these guys. What did I tell you that we need to start doing before I step in front of the camera from now on? Just bump music right before every shoot. Get some speakers and... Um... Boom. I literally, thank you, Eric. Thank you. I literally said to Eric, like, let's put fingers and speakers in here because what I want to do, it takes me like about three times to get an episode started. So you guys know, I literally have all these false starts because I'm like, hey, God, I was like, oh God, I don't have the energy. All right, let's do it. All right, guys, what up? This is Lisa. Oh no, I kind of felt kind of crap. That's how I show up every single time I'm on camera. And so I literally said to Eric, you know what, Eric, we just need freaking music. I listen to my, my um, AirPods, but music is my jam. It gets me in a state. It takes me out of my head and it literally just gets my body going. So first of all, one thing, music. Every single morning when I work out, I listen to music. Every time I want to show up feeling freaking badass, I listen to music. My jam, my song of choice, is Survivor by Destiny's Child. Just listen to the lyrics, guys. Like, I'm a survivor. Like, ah. no matter what you're going through, they cover all of that in that song. So I just get amped. So I listen to music. And then, like I said, as I come onto this show or, and, and step in front of the camera, I have to gear up. Now, what is my gear up? My hair. My hair. My hair is the gear up. The necklace. All right? Take, take a little look. Oh, my wonder woman hiding. I wear my Wonder Woman necklace because when I put it on, and this is a habit and a routine, I have purposely cultivated. This isn't by accident. When I first put it on, I was like, oh, this is cute. And I was like, oh, what if I can I use this as some sort of symbol? Like, how can I use this to help me? And I really do that. Look, my hand, like I get my whole body. And I'm like, ah, oh, every time I put it on, I'm reminding myself of what I'm made of. All right. So now if I tell myself time and time and time again, every single morning I put on this necklace, this is what you're made of, Lisa. This is what you're made of. Well, all of a sudden now, as soon as I feel it, as soon as I see it in the mirror, I go, that's what you're made of. Now this necklace, this is very symbolic to me. I'm just giving you examples of me and then you can hopefully translate it in your life. This necklace, this pretty damn heavy. When we started Quest, when I didn't believe in myself, when I had no idea what the hell I was doing, where I, um, I didn't feel like I belonged in the business world. I saved every penny, every single penny. I was so driven to save my house because my house was on the line for the company that I refused to spend even a dime on jewelry. And so flash forward, company does very well. I buy myself a piece of jewelry. And because of the weight of it, and because of the fact that I didn't allow myself jewelry in the, in the past, when I look in this mirror, it reminds me of who I was and where I am now. It reminds me of my journey. So other people may if I can oh, you got a big, you know, um, show off necklace. I don't give a shit. Fine. You can judge me. I don't care. It means something to me. So going back to confidence, same with the watch. This shit's heavy guys, <laughs> but I love it. It gives me a motivation because when I'm relaxed, when I'm out of like camera mode, my hair is up. I don't have any makeup on. I got my onesie on. I don't have the jewelry and I feel a different way. And so knowing that, how do I suit up for confidence and how do I dress, um, undress, that sounds a little rude, how do I decompress and I use all of this, literally. So jewelry, makeup, hair, 
the clothes I wear. I knew this episode was going to be about confidence. So I was like, all right, I've got two choices. I either show my arms because that makes me feel confident or I wear bright colors. So I chose bright colors today. But if you want to show up as a routine, you have to pay attention to these tiny little things that we do on a daily basis. And so those were the two that I'm just going to throw out. So it's the music, easy, have your jam, have a favorite song, have maybe even have a couple on like when I need to boost my confidence, when I need to tell myself that I have zero confidence, I have to remind myself that I do. Maybe you listen to a different song. So just get to know yourself, get to know how it feels when you listen to the song, when you put on the jewelry, maybe it's not jewelry for you. Maybe it's um, like a, I don't know, a freaking Target sweater. Freaking love Target. So like whatever it is, it doesn't even matter what it is. How do you feel when you do it and can you lean into it? That's the key. I lean into it. I was like, oh, okay, I can remind myself of this. And now I just instinctually believe it. So it's like, what came before, what came first? The chicken or the egg? Did I make it up and then feel it or did I feel it and then make it up? Who knows? At the end of the day, I don't care. The goal is when I dress up like this and I step in front of the camera and I play my music, you better freaking believe I'm feeling confident. How do you determine if you have the right to have confidence, especially when you have not accomplished your goals? Oh my God. Wow. I didn't expect this question to come because it so has thrown me off. Like, of course you've got the right to have confidence. To me, confidence isn't about accomplishment. Those are actually very different. Have you accomplished something? And are you confident? Those are so separate. So confident means to me, is how do you feel about yourself when you do something? Are you nervous? Are you fearful? Are you strong? Are you worried? Are you confident? Right? It's a feeling. But there is no right. Imagine I said, do you have the right to be happy? Well, Jesus, that's just a horrible question to ask someone. Of course you have the right to be happy. So... I want to just nix the idea that you don't have the right to be confident, you 100%. And I want to nix the idea that accomplishment and confidence are actually the same thing, because they're not. So there you go. Of course you have the freaking right to feel confident. It's hard, you have to work at it, it's like a muscle, you have to build it. But of course you have the right, and don't you dare let anyone tell you otherwise. Don't you dare let anyone tell you otherwise. And if they do, you send them to me. I'll have at them. (laughs) Ladies, ladies, ladies. I know sometimes you worry that you're not good enough. Trust me, nobody knows that better than me. I spent almost a freaking decade having my soul sucked out of my body, doing something that I didn't love. Finally, even though I was scared to freaking death, I decided I was going to go for it. And I've ended up building the life of my dreams, a life I couldn't have imagined because I realized that radical confidence is being afraid and doing it anyway. I wrote this book for you with 10 no BS lessons that you need to go from feeling stuck and frustrated to doing anything that you set your mind to. So you said, I was bullied constantly by my peers and I had no friends. I thought it was my fault. I thought that there was something wrong with me. Mm. Maybe if I change myself, people would like me. And the reason why I wanted to start there is because I think that that's something that people struggle with so much, being accepted. Yeah, so when I was young, I would go to school and I didn't have friends and I was getting bullied and I figured there must be something wrong with me because everyone's living these lives and they seem to be happy and have friends. And um, I started quickly looking to externals and thinking that maybe in order to be happy, you had to be successful, you had to be beautiful, you had to be a really talented athlete or get good grades. And I just figured there was some internal flaw within me so terrible that I believed externals would maybe make up for it. And I put a tremendous amount of pressure on myself to reach Um, unrealistic expectations. Maybe if I'm the best tennis player in the whole entire world, I'll be accepted and happy and have self-esteem and have friends. And maybe that will make up or hide what's so wrong with me. And I I did the same thing, sort of this black and white thinking, um, all or nothing. Either I have to be the best or I'm worthless. And that was 
just something I, a core belief that stuck with me from a very young age. Yeah, it never dawned on me. So growing up, I had a mother who um, was basically anorexic. I don't know if she ever labeled herself that. Mm -hmm. But um, I grew up seeing, you know, very, her eating very little and just kind of getting completely mm -hmm. um, skinny. Um, and it never dawned on me that it was about the control. I always yes. thought it was about the food. Yeah. So talk to me about the control yeah. element of that. Yeah, I felt so out of control now for me. I couldn't control whether my peers were going to bully me or accept me. I tried really hard to be the best student and get the top grades, but I couldn't always control that. There were always going to be other people who maybe were smarter than I was. I couldn't control whether or not I was going to lose a tennis match. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon that pressure that I put on myself to be the best at everything. Who can do that? Like, mm. I don't even think Superwoman can do that. No. Um, you know, pretty soon I was like, I can't do it anymore. And so I started um, turning to food. And my mind kind of came up with these weird games, like maybe I'll count calories or I'll try to like get my food or eat the same, same thing every day. And it simplified my life. Mm. Uh, just being able to focus on food rather than what was really, really hurting me internally, which was anxiety and depression and loneliness and not having friends and just believing I was a bad person somehow. And so by distracting my mind, by thinking about food mm -hmm. and my body and my weight, that gave me a sense of control. However, early on, I didn't even know it was an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. I just knew that I would get instant gratification every time I saw the number on the scale get less. Or if I saw a slight change in my body or appearance, I somehow believed maybe that's gonna lead me to happiness. Maybe that will fill the holes in me that are empty right now and make me happy. Yeah, and it was in taking that control for yourself that seemed to have then spiraled you down into like mm -hmm. severe anorexia and being hospitalized. Yeah. And this is what I really like, I was excited to talk to you about because yeah. there's certain moments of control that I think can be amazing for you, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you're saying about the, you know, looking at the number on the scale for yeah. people who are unhealthy, overweight, yeah. taking control is actually good for them. Absolutely. But sometimes in your case, taking yeah. the control probably, in fact, was yeah. it the worst? that could have happened mm -hmm. and how like have you been able to look at that control and be like okay this is when it's good for me and this isn't when it's yeah good for me? absolutely I mean back when I was really struggling I thought I was in control but in reality I was completely out of control mm. um what for me now it's really a huge strength and what I had to realize was just in my recovery process through all of these eating disorders and everything I've been through um Change is scary when I think for anyone, and especially for me, just the thought of change, um, especially taking that first step, it's so terrifying that you're just like, you start thinking like, how do I get from A to Z? And how do I get from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mm -hmm. mountain? And that's just not how it works. You don't change overnight. And I kept putting a tremendous amount of pressure that oh my God, everything has to change. Like, that's too scary. That's too scary. I, I can't do it. But um, it's really not about changing yourself, but just rearranging. Where are you putting that energy and that strength? I've always had, which helped me survive really unthinkable things. Um, I've always had a huge amount of fight and strength and perseverance, but I was putting all that energy into the wrong areas of mm. myself and into the wrong outlets. And that's why I got to such really destructive places internally, which then bled out to external, um, my external life as well. But really I had to rearrange my thinking mm -hmm. one by one and that led to change, but 
it was just transferring that same fight and energy towards positives within me. All right, that's so freaking powerful. So let's break it down so that people who are listening or watching can actually use that in their own life. Yeah. Because I also don't actually think that you have to have had an eating disorder to re be able to relate to what you're talking no. about. I think it's any emotional struggle that you're going Absolutely. through. So let's break that down. So eventually you realize it's actually not good for you, but you right, you don't realize this yeah. for so long. Yeah. People are saying you're unhealthy, you're about to yeah. die, you're anorexic, yeah. and you're still like hiding weights in your yep. bra. Mm -hmm. So clearly, it wasn't people telling you no so no. what was that thing that made yeah. you take that shift and then how can people at home replicate that yeah so and again like you said it really doesn't matter whether it's whether you're struggling with an eating disorder or you're just unhappy in your life whether you're struggling with your weight addiction um it they're all they share so many similarities mm -hmm. and overlaps so for me I really had to get to a, a place everyone kept asking me um, you know, do you want to die? And I told myself, no, I, I don't want to die. But what no one ever really asked me and what I never asked myself was, do you want to live? And I had to think about that and it hit me really hard because when I just reframed that question, I realized that, okay, I don't want to die. Like, but do I really want to live? Because I have one foot in destruction and one foot in life and so I'm just existing right now and that felt safe and that felt comfortable however was I happy no and so I really had to get honest with myself and say look you are you know where your eating disorder is going to take you you know where not taking care of yourself is going to lead you you're going to be unhappy um but you're also terrified of really living and you've never mm. done that either. But right now you're kind of just stuck. You're not taking a step in either direction. And I hit rock bottom in my mind. And that's where um, all my problems and wrongful thinking, that's where it all started. It was just how I mentally thought about myself. Mm. And then that turned into how I perceived the world and my surroundings. And that's also really where my healing began is going back to my mind and just really breaking it down again and looking in the mirror and saying, no, you aren't a bad person and I do want to live. And despite everything I've gone through, I can still change and I can take what I've gone through and actually use it as strength. And one by one, that started to slowly change my life. And it doesn't, again, happen overnight. I think the hardest part, too, with any sort of healing is that you can't see it, which was really hard for me, who was always clinging to external validations. And what I really had to do was find ways to go within myself and boost um, my self-esteem hmm. Uh, how, how do you do yeah. that though? Because if you're in a situation where you've gone like, you're like 56 pounds in the hospital, yeah. then you transition, you start eating healthy. Everyone's encouraging you, yeah. even though you're eating junk food, right? Yeah. But people are like, oh no, yeah. you look great. Yeah. And then you went too far over, let's yeah. say, and went up to 221 yeah. pounds. How do you, in that mist of being so like tumultuous, right? Your life mm -hmm. of like losing weight, putting on too much. Yeah. You've got all this outside noise yeah. that I'm sure is screaming at you. How do you navigate all of that to then find yeah. that voice that yeah. allows you to dig deep? Yeah. Um, I didn't know my own voice for mm. ever. I did not know who I was. If you asked me anything about myself, I had just become so used to my identity being the girl with the eating disorder right. or the girl who... I was the athlete. I was the good student. Mm -hmm. I was anything but Brittany. Yeah. Anything. And um, a big part of my healing was saying, I need to learn how to validate myself alone. And without oh, wow. any sort of external um, feedback or any sort of external successes, I have to go and heal and I have to find out who I am by myself. Who is Brittany? And is she good enough without straight A's. Is she good enough without a smile on her face? And what's so difficult about that process and any sort of healing is that it's very lonely. 
and it does not happen overnight. And no one can see when you're changing your mind, it's not visible. Mm -hmm. So if you're losing weight or if your body's mm -hmm. changing, um, it's easy to look in the mirror to have people say, hey, look, you look different, you know, good job. And you've got um, outside people congratulating you and being your cheerleader. And when you're doing any sort of, I think, just healing that's going to last or if you're really trying to change your mind or if you're looking for something that is not going to be a quick fix but a change that will take you through your whole life, then you're going to put in a tremendous amount of work that no one can see. Mm -hmm. And it's um, you're, you have to be your own cheerleader and you have to say, okay, I'm working really hard but it looks different than the type yeah. of work that you're doing. And you have to be okay with that and trust that you're lying, you're building a foundation that's going to then give you those things that you want. Yeah, that's incredible. And I didn't expect you to say that because so many people, like the people that I've had on the show, or people that I talk outside to, most people say surround yourself with friends and family, <laughs> right? Like, that's yeah. the, like, how do you get out of this situation? Yeah. The answer I mostly 99% of the time get yeah. is be around friends and family. But then how do you, because you actually almost, in a way, like, I get it, but you kind of yeah. contradicted yourself as well yeah. by saying, but it felt lonely. But yeah. You almost need to do it. Mm -hmm. So how on earth do you not yeah. let the loneliness take over mm -hmm. again and say to yourself, no, lonely, being lonely right now is what I need. Yeah. Like, I don't, how would you, how do you yeah. navigate that? So I was very used to the company of my eating disorder. And oh. that, you know, because I didn't have a lot of friends anyway growing up and throughout a lot of my life. I never had good friends. I've been very fortunate to always have a very supportive family. Right. But besides that, it was just my, I had my eating disorder was sort of like my built-in worst best friend. And so without, oh. as I began to recover, my head got quieter because my eating disorder got, got quieter no matter how many good friends I did meet or how supportive my family was, it had to come from me. And I think what was so difficult and what was really a wake-up call for me, for me was I was the only one who could save myself. And I kept thinking, you know, for being such a hardworking individual, I could never seem to recover. And I thought I would never recover from my eating disorder. I thought I would never change. And I felt I had exhausted every option. And I got to the point where I was so lonely. I was so fed up. I had no self-esteem. I didn't believe in myself at all. I wanted someone else to just say like, here's the magic wand, here's the magic mm. formula, here's the magic diet, here's the magic therapist, here's the magic anything, move, anything. I was willing to have anyone just tell me what to do. Mm. And none of it ever worked. It might last, it might have lasted very temporarily, mm. but then all the bad all the bad thoughts that I had about myself or bad behaviors would soon come back. And really to change my life, I had to realize that I had to make the choice for myself and my parents couldn't make my eating disorder go away. It wasn't my fault that I developed an eating disorder and that's really important, it wasn't a choice. But as far as recovery and as far as wanting to change my life, only I could do it. And it didn't matter if I received the best treatment or no treatment and for anyone else, if they're going through a tough time, support is so necessary, but ultimately it has to come from you. Mm. And you have to have some sort of fire within, something that drives you, that's bigger than you, that will keep you going, even when you don't want to, even in those lonely moments. So what was that fire for you? For me, it was everyone, it was the other people that were struggling that reached out to me. And Eating disorders mm. and just mental health is so secretive and it's not talked about. And I began sharing my story and people were, they'd write me privately and be like, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. And mm. I thought I was the only one who had these crazy thoughts or who did these weird things or who hated myself. And, um, and so it was really just hearing also that 
other people shared similar experiences that I went through and I realized that my voice was important. Maybe I can be that one person that they could look to in their darkest times so that they don't have to go down to roads as dark as I did. Mm. And I really wanted that for others because I didn't have it when I was struggling. I always mentally think, all right, I pretend I'm talking to like my younger self or if someone comes to me or someone reaches out to me, I always think, you know, if it were me and if I were really back struggling with my anorexia, this one person and what they're saying, even a stranger really could have changed my life. Maybe I can help them hang on, even if it's just for a week. Maybe I can help them move along in their life in a better way. That's amazing. So. Um, how do you not get trapped in identity, right? Because yeah. You've gone through evolution, so you've gone through being an anorexic, mm -hmm. you've been labeled that, and then mm -hmm. you get better and you become was binge, clinic, eating. binge eating, clinically yeah. obese, I'm not quite sure yes. what the correct term yeah. is. Um, then you become, that's your identity. Mm -hmm. And now you're the, your identity is the recovering. Yeah. So how do you actually not get yeah. trapped in any of those? Because even yeah. now, even though it's amazing that you're in recovery, mm -hmm. something inside me is telling me it's actually a little dangerous to then label you that as well. It's really difficult. I have to, and I've gone my relationship with myself and with just how much do I want to put my time into mm -hmm. helping others with eating disorder and this and that how much do I want to talk about it that has been such a difficult balance for me personally um because again it's just the more you immerse yourself in it it's kind of addicting and it's kind of addicting again not in a necessarily a healthy way to attach your identity even to something positive. And so I definitely went through a period where I sort of felt like I have to be the perfect recovery right. role model. And again, that's like exactly the opposite of what recovery is mm -hmm. and what I stand for. Recovery is, it's up and down, it's a roller coaster, it's anything but linear. And yet I was almost holding myself to this unrealistic standard that especially when talking about mental health, where no, you know, it's such a sensitive topic. It, everyone's going to have a different experience, but I was putting this pressure on myself that I have to be this perfect recovery voice for everyone struggling with anorexia, for struggling with binge eating disorder, for struggling with bulimia, for struggling with anxiety, depression, PTSD, mental health. How do I be, I can't say anything wrong. I have to be perfect. And Yet, how I got, how I went through all that I went through and got to where I am now, it was through being so goddamn imperfect that, I mean, I was just, my life was a catastrophe. I was just, just this raging ball of chaos is probably what an outsider mm. would have thought or what was going on in my mind. And so I'm very careful now with just boundaries. Mm. And I think doing all that internal work and really getting to know myself alone to getting to know myself, who am I without the identity of a, a good student? Who am I without an eating disorder? Who am I um, without friends? Who am I without, you know, an amazing job, or I really had to say, am I okay with myself, Brittany Burgunder, with nothing? And I had to get to know myself inside and out and look in the mirror and say, you know what? Yeah, I am proud of you, and you are good enough, and no, you're not perfect, and that's okay, and not everyone will like you, and that's okay, and you can continue to grow and learn, and you still are important in this world just as you are right mm -hmm. now. And that has carried over to help me now with, yeah, I'm a voice for recovery, but I have many other interests and I have many other things that are important to me. And so I think, again, it's just knowing that recovery, and that's a huge part of me, and that's my passion, mm -hmm. and I feel that's my purpose in life but it doesn't define me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't label me and it doesn't confine me to a certain way because then I lose who I am. Um, so I do have a good balance between doing the work I'm passionate about, but then also making sure my mind is filled with 
other content that inspires me and motivates me and helps me grow as an individual. And then I get on the tennis court and I go have fun. And, you know, I, mm. <laughs> I got a puppy. I have, you know, I have good friends. But it, there has to be a balance. Mm. And what it comes down to is if I lost this or that, mm. or if I go through a hardship, if I have a challenge in my life, if social media was gone, if my business was gone, if I could never play tennis again, would I still be a good person? Would I still be, could I still look in, in the mirror and say, you have value? And I do. But it took me a really long time and a lot of alone time to get to that point. Yeah. And I assume it's never ending, right? I mean, even mm -hmm. now people look at you, you're very articulate, very well spoken. Mm -hmm. You're able to really take ownership of your past mm -hmm. and what you've learned. And, yeah. you know, it, you're so incredible. And I have been so inspired for you from you um, for so many years. Mm -hmm. um, but how do you make sure that you don't let that then keep you where you are and you're still yeah. able to keep growing? Yeah. I, I, again, I start looking probably to new people mm -hmm. and new ways to challenge my mind. And for me, if something scares me, I have to do it because I know that's what's going to help me grow. And for me, like being a voice for recovery or the eating disorder world, I guess you could say I'm, I'm good at it because I, I know it, but it doesn't challenge me and it doesn't mm -hmm. help me grow. And so I've really learned that there is really the best thing you can do is be a beginner in life and in many different things. And to realize that you're not starting over from square one, but it's amazing to learn. How do I stop comparing myself to others? There are so many women I look up to, but I have a hard time watching their success without having it negatively impact my self-esteem. All right, thank you for this wonderful question and really, really being transparent over how you're feeling around others. Um, I think that's really hard to assess. Most of us, at least when we're feeling insecure, um, don't actually realize that it's um, that we're tr being triggered. So I just wanna applaud you right now for actually acknowledging and recognizing when you're triggered and who's triggering you. That is already incredible and you've already done a lot of the work there. So now I actually wanna go to the difference between jealousy and envy. So growing up, I used to be jealous. Every time I saw other people like you that had amazing things that I looked up to, that I admired, it would just trigger something inside me. And it would trigger something that made me feel worse about myself. Now, over time, what I realized is the fact that I was getting triggered and feeling worse was it was highlighting the things I either wasn't doing or that I was using as an excuse or I was just, um, I gave myself the out by just saying, well, I'm not good at it. And so every time I would see someone that I would admire, that would do something that I thought I couldn't do or wasn't there yet or was incapable of doing, it would start to create an emotion in me, it made me feel badly about myself. It would make, it would shine a light onto myself. And then that would highlight all the things that I either thought I was bad at, insecure over. And so you can imagine when that happens, just like you said, it actually does impact your self-esteem. It makes you feel worse about yourself. All right. Just like everything that I always talk about, when something doesn't serve me, I try to stop it. When I can't stop it, I think of other ways that it can serve me. Jealousy doesn't serve me. Jealousy only made it worse. It made me feel worse about myself, which, when, which then put me into a bit of a spiral about how useless I was, how bad I was at things. And it would start to really start um, creating this repeat cycle in my head, and then that would become a habit, and now all I'm doing is repeating over and over about how bad I am doesn't serve me. So now I take that very same thing and I say, how can I look at other people, this thing that makes me feel worse about myself, this thing that's shining a light on how bad I am, how do I turn that and make it amazing? How do I take my kryptonite and make it my superpower? Because that's ultimately the goal, guys. How can we take something and to use it to our advantage to actually serve what we're trying to freaking do? And so this situation with someone that you admire is now making you feel badly, how do you spin it? Okay, first of all, acknowledging where you are right now. Right now, you actually may not be able to spin it. Right now, the emotions of how much is triggering you may be just too difficult. So I really wanna make sure that I start there, that if that is happening, sometimes you just have to maybe stop looking at them. You maybe have to stop following them. You maybe have to stop engaging in the things that they do. So in the time, maybe just the for the time being, maybe just for the time being. 
but don't worry if that's what you need. Remember, right now, the first step into this evolution, into looking at amazing people and having them be an inspiration, is to just acknowledge where you are. Maybe you're not able to look at them as an inspiration yet. So, give yourself the freaking grace. Give yourself the grace right now to say, this person triggers me, and I'm gonna work on it. I'm not just gonna accept it, I'm gonna work on it, but for right now, I just can't look at them for a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. Now you can work on yourself, you can work on that, that trigger of why that really impacted you. So let's say for instance, I look at Oprah and I say, how amazing she is at hosting. And I'm like, well, shit, that triggers all the insecurity inside me. It triggers all the things that I'm not good at. The fact that I come in front of the camera and I mess up, the fact that I'm mumbling over my words, the fact, all these things that I can look at Oprah and go, oh my God, she's so freaking fire. She keeps her cool. She never seems anxious on, on camera. She never seems like she stumbles. She never seems like she's lost her freaking words. Now I could use that as a detriment and say how bad I am, or I can go, all right, if she did it, I can do it too. If she did it, how can I do it too? Guys, that's freaking envy. That's when you can look at someone so mind-blowingly amazing so mind-blowingly amazing and not let it be detrimental to your self-esteem but actually in fact be the complete opposite see it as a freaking inspiration and i'm telling you the only way you can do that the only way you can take someone that you admire and see them as an inspiration instead of seeing them as intimidation is looking at where you are right now seeing where your insecurities are acknowledging your insecurities and one by one working on building those insecurities up so that when you do, when you then see Oprah or whoever it is that person that is inspiring you or maybe triggering you, you can then take them for a beautiful teacher. You can take them as a beautiful mentor. You can look at their life. You can look at how they've shown up every day. And then you can say, how do I do that too? so freaking powerful, but it all starts with assessing where you are and then with grace, identifying what you need to work on and step-by-step step working on those things. And then eventually being able to look at that freaking badass and admiring them and seeing them as inspiration. How do you exude confidence without offending others, especially people in a position of power when I disagree with what they're saying or have a different take on an issue? All right, so the key here is when, um, when are you exuding confidence and when are you spilling over into being super obnoxious and super arrogant? There is a fine line. And how I assess the fine line is how do you treat other people? Do you come in and exude confidence and try and tear them down while you're exuding confidence? Um, or are you showing them beauty, grace, respect, but still holding your own? Because that's the difference. If you come in, you try to bring someone else down to make yourself feel confident, that is when you've spilled over and yes, you are absolutely offending and disrespecting others, if I can be so honest. When you are treating other people like they um, do not exist, that their opinions do not count or their opinions do not matter, that is when you are exceeding your confidence into arrogance and being obnoxious. So there are fine lines. So really it is what is the intention you have in your heart? Are you trying to enlighten the situation when you come into the, com uh, come into the meeting, let's say? Are you um, trying to make other people feel less confident so that you can bring yourself up? Um, how are you actually, what is your intention? Let's start there. So now if you know, my intention is really cute. Pure. I really want to come into the conversation and not offend other people. Great. That's where we're going to go into the second part of this question, where you are worried that you don't want to offend people in power, especially when you disagree with them. All right. So this is when it comes in and says, what are the words you are choosing? If you walk into any situation and you're just like, you're wrong, where does that leave someone? When someone comes to you and says, you're wrong, where does that leave you? You either get defenses or you put walls up, but it's very hard to go, oh, okay, tell me, tell me all the ways that I'm wrong. It's just difficult, even if that's the right answer. So go, knowing that that happens with you, how do you go into a meeting and disagree with someone? What words do you use? What are the choice of words that you use in that situation? Are you trying to demean someone? Are you trying to pull them down? Or are you just trying to say, hey, actually, I don't agree with you there, and this is why. You can absolutely do that with respect. Now, here's the tricky thing. 
I don't know who you're talking to. So I don't know how they will respond. Because even if you go into it, this is key, guys. Even if you go into this situation, go, all right, I'm going to go in there with respect. I'm going to go in there with pure of heart because I disagree, but I actually am doing it in, you know, in good of the company, in good of the team, in good of the group, in good of this person. If you go in there with the intention, then that will come across. So making sure that you go into that situation with the right intention and using the right words so the other person doesn't put their walls up. And now... What happens when you disagree if they push back? How do you handle it? What do you say? Because there's one thing about how you go into the situation, but you can't control how the other person is going to re react. So let's take two scenarios. One scenario is you come in with utter respect and you say, hey, I'm really sorry. I actually know that you think like that, but I actually disagree. You know, no hard feelings, but this is why I disagree. Great. You've said no hard feelings. You've gone in and say, hey, I just want to respect you, but I actually disagree. You're being really um, respectful. And the other person shuts you down. I don't know what you're the hell you, who you think you are. You know, you need to stay in your lane. Let's just say that's the pushback you get. How do you respond to that? Even if you're confident in what you said, how do you respond to that? Do you escalate or do you come back with confidence in being firm on your position, because that's the key, guys. If I have confidence in what I'm saying, you can come at me. And here's the great news. If you come at me, I'm actually going to listen, because I'm so confident in my idea. I'm like, you can't even change my mind. But now here's the thing. Because I'm confident, and you let's say you say something that actually makes me change my mind. I'm the type of person that will embrace it and be like, oh, my God, I was so confident over here. I thought for sure that was the winning answer. But man, you've just convinced me why. And now I actually agree you're the right person. Now, I can say that to you as someone coming to me if you come with confidence, grace, and respect. So it works both ways. If you've come to me and I'm the one that's confident, you try and bring me down, you try and like break down my idea of all the confidence that I have, and you're right, I'm confident in myself to go, oh my God, you're so right. So now here's the question. If you're the one coming into these moments where you're saying, you, how do I come in and have the grace and how do I come in with confidence and not offend people? You've got to be so bloody confident in not just the idea, but confident in the outcome, confident in the fact that you want what is right. And if that means someone comes to you with a different idea that is better than yours, are you confident to meet that with a yes and a handshake and a, oh my God, I was wrong? Because let me freaking tell you, that is the power of confidence. Confidence isn't about being right or wrong. So if you go into it, the reason why I really wanted to go there to, with this answer is because if you really get it, confidence isn't just me coming into a room and saying why I disagree. Confidence is someone disagreeing with me and me being able to admit that they're right. That freaking takes confidence. Now, if you can get to that point, which is just the practice, guys, it is just the practice. It is getting told so many times why you are wrong and being able to meet it with grace and recognize when they are right. And it gets easier, it gets easier, it gets easier. And it's practice, practice, practice. So that you get to the point that you can walk into these meetings with confidence, with people with power, say what you think, even when you disagree, and still being able to leave with utter confidence, no matter where the conversation goes. That, my friend, is freaking confidence. How do I accept praise or recognition at work without downplaying my achievements? Oh my God, how many of us do this? How many of us? Thank you for asking this question because I think you're about to help so many other people because we've all been there. All right, I don't want to be presumptive, but most of the time women have this problem where someone says thank you. And in fact, I was literally in this group. I was with these women, what was it, maybe a week ago. And one woman is like, oh my God, you're so good at this. And the other woman literally, no, 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 what are you talking about? No, it was you. Third woman comes in, no, thank you, but actually it was you. You're amazing. And I'm freaking sat there going, 
What is happening? These three incredible females, incredible, are all like literally giving each other praise and they can't accept it. Women that I so admire. And I was like, what is happening? They're all confident. They're all freaking power players. And yet, in these moments, they're all just telling each other how amazing. No, 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 you're amazing. Yes, 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 I know I did that. But let me tell you, when you did this, no one can accept accept a compliment and then even if we can accept it we immediately ping pong and tell the other person why they're even freaking better now here's the thing it's sometimes actually beautiful right let's just take a moment it's actually beautiful that we want to make other people around us feel amazing so i don't want to diminish that i don't want to negate that or actually block that out it is beautiful that we want each other to feel amazing but God damn it, come on people. We do it in total detriment to ourselves. We literally do it in total detriment to ourselves. Ask any of my friends, I call them out. I literally am like, please stop trying to um, ping pong. When I say you're amazing, stop trying to, um, what is it, deflect? Can you just say thank you? And literally, it's like a mission I'm on now. Every time I compliment someone, if they cannot say thank you, I stop them and go, wait, just take it. Just take the fucking compliment. I'll take the compliment if you want. And that, uh, as you can see, guys, I feel so passionate about it. Like, literally, I'm out of breath because of it. But I'm making it a point. I'm absolutely making a point that when someone comes up to me and recognizes the effort I've put in, I recognize now that it is detrimental to myself to not accept it. So now, what do I do? How do we actually do it? Because it's one thing, yes, yes, I know, Lisa, it's one thing to actually say, it's a whole other thing to actually do it. 100%, I agree, which is why we always need a freaking game plan, people. We need a game plan. So the game plan is so simple. The very next time someone says something you've done amazing, you are going to repeat after me. Thank you. You. That's it, guys. Literally, this is where I started. When I started to realize that I was doing this and I was literally like ping ponging, I wasn't accepting any praise or any like recognition of the hard work I know I actually put in. Like, I'm not talking about bullshit, like, oh yeah, I got this. Work I actually freaking put in and don't downplay it. And I needed to stop pushing it off. I realized and recognized with all the work that I do, with all the amount of incredible women I have on my show. I realized I was doing a detriment to myself. So rule number one, the very next time someone pats you on the back for something you know you freaking deserve. And guys, I don't have to explain. You know, you know. When you feel that and someone says something, the very next thing you're going to say is, thank you so much. I want you to practice and then stop talking. <laughs> This is where I was, oh, thank you so much, but, and then you start, all the things of what went wrong, or like, oh, how someone helped you. Maybe someone did help you. Maybe a thousand things did bloody go wrong. But what the F? Why can't we just take the thing that we've worked hard for as recognition of what we did? So, now, I hope that I've convinced you in these last few minutes I've been talking that you are now going to, the very next time someone says something, you are going to recognize it and say, thank you so much. And if you need another word or another phrase, because maybe you need to say some more words, like I of often do, you say, thank you so much for recognizing. I really worked hard at that. Write that down, guys, right now. Get out a pen and paper and write those words down. Thank you so much for recognizing it. I really worked hard at that. It's not being boastful. It's actually acknowledging the freaking hard work you put in. And we have to stop pushing that away. Stop thinking that we are boasting or that it means that we're big head. If we accept the compliments that actually come with recognizing that we freaking busted our asses, we showed up time and time again and we did the work, period. Now, homies, let's freaking own that shit. If someone goes on a first date with you and five days later, they say, what are you up to this weekend? I do think you can be playful about it and be like, uh, I'm 
you know, doing this with my friends. I'm not sure about Sunday. By the way, P.S. This message was three days late.